Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinker series proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. With the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Joe Lamana. He is the Jeanette M. and Joseph S. Silber Professor of Brain Sciences in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics of Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and the past chair of the Department of Anatomy. He is going to talk to us tonight about breathing water and gulping air, the evolution of lungs and other gas exchange organs. Professor Lamana. Thanks, Glenn. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to address this group. Uh, I had uh, a lot of fun putting this together, uh, and I hope I can uh, convey some of that to you as we go uh, forward here. Um, today, what we're really talking about when we want to talk about the lung, we're talking about oxygen, because uh, oxygen in the atmosphere uh, is driving evolution, and that's my main point uh, take home point today is that variations in oxygen in the atmosphere have played a major role in the uh, evolution of organisms and uh, ourselves included. Now, um, up until recently, it wasn't thought that there was much change in the oxygen levels uh, in the, in the uh, atmosphere, but now we have a pretty good idea that well, we always knew that it started off without any oxygen on the Earth for about a billion years or so, no oxygen uh, at all. Uh, the, the universe gives us hydrogen and helium uh, to start with and uh, not much oxygen at all. Um, then there became some oxygen and that was a problem for some cells and a boon for other cells. A problem because oxygen can be toxic and a, and a boon because if you can figure out how to use it, there's a lot of energy in that molecule. And then it turned out that there was a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere and actually turned out to be the maximum amount possible of oxygen uh, became produced. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then it's kind of settled down to what we have today, which I'm calling enough. Of course, it's enough for you and me. Uh, we don't need any more, we don't need any less, so it's probably pretty good for us. Now, to begin with, um, we start with a uh, time course of the history of oxygen in the atmosphere. This is a, a general understanding. These now are billions of years ago, so we start off uh, four billion years ago, and the y-axis here is in terms of a fraction of current atmospheric levels, um, uh, so that 100% of present uh, atmospheric level is what we have today, and then 10% would be 10% less oxygen than we have today. And you can see that starting off, we are less than a thousandth of what we have today, so essentially no oxygen uh, available in the environment and extended for a long period of time. And then there was an event, a great oxidation event, and uh, we're not gonna spend too much time talking about this just to, to note that this occurred. Uh, there was an increase in uh, what we used to call blue-green algae, uh, and now it's cyanobacteria, uh, the same organism. And that's produced a lot of oxygen uh, from sunlight and it took a long time for it to accumulate uh, to minimal levels at least, and even for this long period of time of a billion and a half years, still only less than 10% of current levels. And not much happening here as far as evolution of organisms. This has kind of been called the boring billion sometimes, not like the roaring 20s, this is the boring billion. And uh, then we have the secondary event that uh, uh, occurred, and this is the closer to the modern times, if modern times includes uh, 500 million years ago to the present. Uh, we'll spend some time talking about this aspect of it later, uh, but 
uh, here's what we're, uh, we start with. Uh, and now I think I, I just need to step back a little bit and tell you what it is about oxygen in a, a few short words that is so important for us. So it's, uh, the difference here is the amount of energy that you can get from it. So let's look at what happens if you have a substrate, something that you can eat and try to turn into energy. And the organisms that can turn it into energy, such as, for example, yeast and molds, uh, can ferment that sugar. Now, I'm, I'm not against fermentation at all because, uh, you know, we get beer, we get wine, we get yogurt, things like that. So fermentation is good, but you don't get a lot of energy from it. Um, you, can, you can become a mold if you want, but your mold is not going to build skyscrapers and think great thoughts. Uh, you make lactic acid, for example, from sugar, or you make alcohol. The yeast can make alcohol from the sugar. These are chemical reactions that modify the molecule of glucose or the glucose equivalent, the sugar equivalent, and takes small amounts of energy from it. And in the absence of oxygen, this is all that's available to organisms. And I note that you get about two ATP from so-called anaerobic glycolysis. Now, ATP is the energy currency uh, of cells. This is where they get energy from. It's the, what we call, used to call the high energy phosphate bond of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And breaking of that bond would, could release a large amount of energy that then can be applied to uh, all of the energy-using enzymes in, in the body. So it's a, it's a very important uh, molecule, ATP, that, that is used for uh, energy by the cells. Now, if you could burn the sugar with oxygen, with burning essentially is oxidation. Rust is a burning of iron. Uh, uh, you can burn sugar. This is an example of a marshmallow on fire. You may have seen that. If you light a marshmallow on fire, it'll stay on fire and it'll burn the sugar and produce a lot of heat and energy. That's kind of the same thing that we do, except we do it slower and in more uh, smaller steps so we don't uh, get, catch fire. We keep it constant temperature. But if you do it that way, uh, you get 38 ATP uh, compared to 2 ATP. It's almost 20 times more energy by burning oxygen than you would by, uh, just by uh, uh, sugar, by sugar uh, chemical fermentation. So this is a, a very good thing. And the, um, being able to use oxygen to make energy made a big difference in the lives of the initial cells. And the organelles that do this are mitochondria, and that story of how we got the mitochondria and what they do is for another day. Uh, if you'll just accept for the moment that uh, that's the organelle that takes the sugar and burns it with oxygen and provides us with the ATP. Being able to do that allowed cells to become, to join together and make multicellular organisms. You can't have uh, mitosis, you can't have mitotic cell division without the energy that is produced oxidatively. You cannot have the evolution of multicellular organisms and complex organisms without the energy that's provided by oxygen. So the first step from uh, the bacterial state or the archaean state, uh, either of those two um, uh, of the uh, uh, families of organisms, to progress into eukaryotes, that cells with true nucleus that can divide and become multicellular organisms, required oxygen. So from the very beginning, uh, it's clear that g getting oxygen and uh, using it to make energy is a great advantage for cells to become more complex. Now, in addition to uh, that, um, having the oxygen uh, allows uh, it, it, with, with oxygen energy uh, available, it allows cells to become bigger. And this uh, fact allows the beginning of predation. So bigger is better because you can be the predator, or if you're big enough, it's hard to be prey. 
And then it, this ability to use oxygen can allow you to move from the water environment to the land and exploit the land environment. So let's think about it for a minute. Here we have uh, the, the energy production by taking sugar and fermenting it, for example, or any substrate level uh, chemistry is about 10% efficient. That is, uh, you can only extract 10% of the energy of the molecule by the fermentation. This is not a system that allows for predation. Predation means that the first organism uh, made the energy, and then you, the second organism eats the first organism to get the energy out. But if it's 10% each step, then after the first step, you're already down below 1% efficiency. And so it doesn't pay for an organism that's on a 10% efficiency uh, 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 diet uh, to uh, prey on other organisms. But oxidative use, burning the uh, sugar with oxygen, is 40% efficient. Now, if you have an organism that's 40% efficient and it's gobbled up by another organism that's 40% efficient, you still have a significant amount of the energy that's available and in fact, you can support maybe six levels of predation before that sixth uh, uh, level is getting, uh, not getting enough out of, the, uh, out of the deal. Then, so a point of fact is that predation favors the growth in size of both the predator and the prey. And as in a lot of things in science, somebody who noticed that the first time and figured it out, uh, whose name was Cope, uh, may, we now have a rule called Cope's rule that animal species tend to get larger with time as size offers protection against predation. Now if we move on to how do you get the oxygen? So now we're jumping to we know that oxygen is valuable, we know why it's valuable, and now how do you get it? So the first, uh, we, we need a couple of the principles, and that is uh, there's not a whole lot of oxygen dissolved in water normally. Um, seven milliliters of oxygen gas may be in the water, and it's affected by uh, whether it's fresh water or uh, seawater, and it's affected by the temperature, but it's not affected by water pressure. So cold water holds more uh, oxygen than warm water, and in fact, there are some very cold water fishes that can get by with very minimal amounts of oxygen carrying capacity in Arctic waters. Um, and the fresh water holds more because you can think of it that there's more room in the water because there's no salt there. Somebody, everything takes up space. And so without the salt and the minerals, there's more room for the oxygen. Now we, we spend this 30 seconds on water because the water environment, the, the sea, the dilute sea environment, is where the life is, uh, and complex multicellular life is originating and first uh, adapting. So it turns out that a liter of air has a lot more. There's 21% uh, oxygen in air, so it's uh, 209 mils per, per uh, liter. Even on Everest, it's uh, one third of that, but that's still a lot. Bottom line is, if you're living in the sea, you have to process 30 times more of the carrying substance than if you're living in the air. Although it is easier to get rid of the CO2. So let's go through the respiratory organs. If we start off with small animals, don't move very much. They have no gills, they don't need them. They have simple diffusion. Uh, they have very thin skins around a skeleton. They, um, uh, so oxygen just diffuses in and out. This is a sea coral, it's a, uh, a sponge, it's not an animal, it just happens to have these tubes that are in the unfortunate shape of looking like Cookie Monster. Uh, you have these sponges here, these types of sponges that sit and the water goes by and the oxygen comes out. Next you have gills, and gills are evaginations uh, there are passive ones like this salamander. Uh, these fancy looking uh, uh, structures are all gills. Now having gills and simple diffusion doesn't make you stay very small. Here we have a, a giant salamander, for example, uh, that can, uh, can exist uh, 
so you can, you can get a fairly large animal by uh, uh, simple uh, gas diffusion. Uh, you have pumps where you have like mollusks and the, and the clam opens and closes and pushes the water past the gills uh, and has the advantage of being protected because it's inside the shell. That salamander has those nice gills outside. They'll be very attractive to predators. You have an active pump that's from uh, that uh, fish. They move their gills. They pump uh, water through. So you have the active gill system. And, and you have lungs. And you have lungs are a bunch of different types. You have the simple uh, sac-like lungs. These are frog lungs. And this picture comes from Malpighi's work. This figure serves two purposes uh, from a historical point. It was Malpighi who, looking at the lungs of frogs, where he could see the capillaries around the surface of the sac, that showed that you, the uh, blood went from an artery to a vein through a small vessel called the capillary. And that discovery, looking with the microscope, at once put the death knell uh, on uh, Galen's uh, uh, anatomy and vindicated Harvey, uh, who showed the circulation of the blood. And then you have the alveolar type lungs, and that's the lungs that we, we have, very complex little air sacs. This is a cast filling the sacs. Uh, so those are, the, those are the types of organs that we have to deal with moving uh, air, uh, moving oxygen from the medium into the organism. If we can uh, go to your boring billion, you know, from your thing, it's something that, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, when you started getting free oxygen in the atmosphere from uh, the blue-green algae and stromatolites, it would react chemically. The oxygen would react chemically with uh, things like iron or other minerals. Is it possible that this oxidation, you know, taking the oxygen out of it, is what took so long for life to really develop to get a foothold? Once the organisms began to generate oxygen, um, the oxygen is generated into an environment that we call a reducing chemical environment. Um, and it's essentially a toxic pollutant to the organisms in that environment. And it's taken out of the environment mostly uh, by iron. There was a lot of free, soluble iron. The ferrous form of iron is soluble. And all of the iron in the oceans had to precipitate out before oxygen could build up. And we have these... Uh, uh, structures that you can see two and a half, two and a half to two billion years ago that are layers of red bands, banded iron formations, BIFs. I think the museum has a good example of it. They used to have it right outside. I don't know where it is now. That used to be right as you walked in. The banded iron formation showing over a tremendous amount of time how much iron was taking, uh, had to be taken out of the environment first. There is a second reason, though, that oxygen didn't build up. And that is a little bit more complicated. But with oxygen being built up, there are organisms that use the oxygen. So they were in a balance. And the only way there would be a change is if there was a change in either the rate of oxygen formation over long periods of time, which was the initial urge, but then the loss of carbon. So this would be, in the sea, this would be uh, carcasses of uh, of uh, carbonate-containing organisms that would fall to the bottom of the ocean, and they would no longer be uh, using, uh, be available for oxygen. So it wasn't until the uh, carbon was falling out that the oxygen started to really build up. I guess as a continuation, so was the oxygen present? It was just trapped or, you know, connected with other molecules? Yeah, it's a good question. The, the oxygen, as free oxygen, was not available. But it's there in the carbonate. Carbonate is CO3. So there's three oxygens for each carbon. And in silicates and all the eights, there are in the rocks. So uh, both carbon and oxygen are, um, there's huge stores of carbon and oxygen in, in the rock formations. Sometimes when they weather, they become uh, uh, available. And that contributes to changes in CO2 or O2. Um, but yes, it's, it's tied up in, uh, in uh, chemical form as well, uh, only, uh, and that's why there's little free oxygen. That's correct, yeah.
thank you for joining us. You've been watching Dr. Joe LaManna discussing oxygen, why it is important for living organisms, and how they extract it from the environment. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. LaManna discusses how the earliest animals evolved to use oxygen. Now, back to the talk. So the next topic, now that we've talked about the types of uh, potential organs to transfer uh, respiratory gases, let's look at some of the um, adaptations over time that occurred. And the first thing I want to talk about is the uh, Cambrian explosion. This is a uh, explosion of life forms, and it, we, we, we uh, start detecting life at this point. We're pretty sure, uh, we, we don't really know what uh, life occurred before this because they, we don't have, soft tissues are hard to uh, 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 be preserved. We only know when the hard tissues began to be preserved. So we have a pretty good idea that somewhere around uh, half a billion years ago, 500 million years ago or so, there was an increase in the fossil record. There's an increase in the evidence for animal life. And in the Cambrian now, uh, if you remember from the curve, which I'll show you again in a minute, this is when oxygen became available for organisms and things really started to happen. The first uh, uh, dominant groups were really the arthropods, the trilobite. Uh, we don't have any trilobites left, they're uh, fossil only. Uh, but basically, they are exoskeletons. And the significance of the exoskeleton is that while it's protective, it also prevents the oxygen from diffusing in. So there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off between the protection of the, uh, of the plates and the ability to get oxygen. Now, they had uh, a, a basic body design that uh, evolved, uh, that was segmented, so the number of segments could be added, and along the side here, the initial places where additional diffusion could be uh, uh, put out in order to get oxygen out of the environment, and the thought is that uh, the respiratory uh, efficiency was more important than locomotion uh, for the design. Now here we are in the half of, uh, last 500 million years, we're already up near present levels, and you notice that there is some fine structure to the oxygen curves here. Um, and so this last this is where the Cambrian started, right at the beginning of this oxygen, uh, 500 million years ago. And now I'm going to switch to this type of a curve uh, for oxygen levels. This side says atmospheric oxygen is percent of the atmosphere. So 21 percent, this dashed line, is today's level. And there's a couple of things to notice here. And that is that there are swings of oxygen up and down sometimes large, and sometimes, uh, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little, hence my original uh, um, slide. And I will say that while uh, this uh, curve looks a lot more, uh, lo looks like we know a lot more than we really do, uh, some of these uh, uh, values have very broad uh, error bars, um, and there's three or four different uh, uh, hypotheses about what the actual shape of the curve is, but what we do know, the fine structure may be off by a little bit, but we do know that there are periods of hypoxia, of low oxygen, and periods of high oxygen, and there are, uh, some of these are correlated with uh, strong increases in evolved uh, creatures. So let's see what happened. This is the Cambrian period, right around 500 million years ago and these little ups and downs, uh, when arthropods were getting ready to come on land but hadn't been there yet. So what do we have? We have uh, jellyfish, uh, jellyfish adaptation. The whole body uh, is thin, and a diffusion of oxygen from the water is enough to oxygenate the jellyfish. Um, we have sponges. Now sponges, they're also very simple. They have thin walls. Uh, around a, a skeleton, 
so the diffusion is only one cell thick, so they can diffuse pretty well. They sit in streams with the water going by, so they're kind of passive that way. But some of the have, organ, uh, have developed special cell structures with cilia. You remember cilia from last week? And the cilia is causing currents that move water in and out of these tubes. So it acts almost like a, uh, a pump gill. It's not really pumping like a mollusk would, but it's the equivalent of a, so it functions like a pump gill would. Uh, you have starfish. They have a box-like structure with a very thin outer layer of skin, so they can go by diffusion. And maybe you're noticing by now that these structures that work by diffusion, these animals, uh, don't do a heck of a lot of running around and jumping. They, they're pretty sedentary, although starfish can get pretty fierce. Uh, you have mollusks and uh, especially cephalopods uh, like the squid and the octopus. Now they're getting more active and they're figuring out how to use uh, the propulsive devices as a way of moving water that's carrying fresh oxygen in and out of their body cavities. That propulsion is not only moving them, but it's allowing fresh oxygenated uh, water to get access to their tissues. We have uh, brachiopods uh, and uh, these bryozoa here. This is a small animal and it has what's called a lophophore. And this is a kind of a branch of cilia that they can sit, send out. They use this for feeding uh, and they also get oxygen from that. And it's either free flowing like in a bryozoa or it's protected by this kind of a shell structure inside of this brachiopod, that's a fossil brachiopod. Then we get to arthropods. Arthropods, very successful phylum. They're segmented like the trilobites were. They have exoskeletons that also are going to block uh, diffusion. And uh, uh, even though it's good for uh, protection, it's bad for diffusion. So uh, to get oxygen, the first arthropods, which all were in a marine environment at this time, they evolve specialized respiratory structures or gills. So here's where we get the gills from in the arthropods. This is a mayfly larva, and, and these are the gills coming from the segments of the mayfly larva. That repeat segment, uh, uh, body segment, body plan, uh, allows the addition of segments to add uh, uh, more diffusion. If you need more diffusion, grow another body segment, and your, your organism is going to have a uh, body plan. So as far as the number of species concerned, arthropods are fairly uh, robust. Now, as we move to the next uh, phase in the graph here, you'll see this is a, a, a time of relative high oxygen. And it's a time when the arthropods uh, went, could get to the land. There's two problems with getting to the land. The first problem was, before there were plants, there's nothing on the land to eat or breathe. So the uh, movement from sea to land had to wait at least for small bits of plants and a bit of oxygen to use to have the energy to move around uh, uh, out of the water. Um, uh, arthropods moving to land as it was a natural uh, environmental niche for them, and uh, they developed structures that allowed them to get oxygen out of either air or water. And one of the uh, interesting ones here is something called a book lung. It's not really a lung, uh, but it looks like uh, layers of a book, uh, and it's, well, it's misnamed. But here it is down here. And with this, the air goes into a spiracle or some kind of a, uh, an opening, allows the air to go in, and then it circulates. There's circulation uh, of the hemolymph or uh, of whatever the uh, blood equivalent might be there uh, in between these uh, tubes that are exposed to the air. So it's, it's not a bad way to get air in, remember, Air is carrying 21% oxygen. 
and the movement of the body of the uh, arthropod or the insect or the spider can move the air in and out of the spiracles. So it's, it's not an inefficient way of getting the air. So in moving these uh, onto land, scorpions probably the first uh, animals, arthropod animals, to get to the land. Uh, they used their wet water gills, and it was about 430 million years ago, at a time when the oxygen concentration was much higher than it is now. And uh, uh, this means that if you were dependent on oxygen and you were switching from a gill system to a spherical system, uh, there were many body types that would make use of either or or both. And there was, a, a, from an energy standpoint, there was enough oxygen that these could be successful for many, many years. Uh, and so there was a lot of variation in how oxygen could be uh, uh, brought in. The problem is, as soon as there's a dip in the oxygen, all the inefficient systems, all the organisms that had the inefficient systems, are no longer competitive and die out. And so somewhere along this period of time uh, here, about 400 million years ago, uh, most of the animals on the land uh, died out. Most of those species died out. Uh, most of those phyla died out because there was a period of poor oxygen, of hypoxia. Now, the reasons for oxygen going up and down, we could also spend a half hour on if we, but, or more, but we don't have time exactly to do that. So, uh, uh, but uh, the, there is uh, enough evidence to show that there are good, solid uh, reasons for this. Now, also, I want you to remember that when we draw a little graph like this and said oxygen went up and down, think about how many tens of millions of years there are. Uh, on this, uh, on this scale here. It's a long time, a very long time. Um, so the uh, getting, for, getting onto the land, the, you have the second wave occurring uh, 370 million years ago. That's right after uh, this period of time. So here, you see, here's where they uh, were getting onto the land. Here's the retreat, and here now is the uh, next wave of uh, arthropod leading the charge to uh, animals getting onto the land. And you have things like uh, horseshoe crabs, which are obviously very successful. We still have them today. And you have the system uh, that uh, insects have of the spiracles and the trachea system, the air delivery of uh, oxygen. Um, and so that began a, uh, another, and not quite explosion, but a, a large increase in the number of species of, of many kinds. And uh, also this was a period of time when the um, oxygen was starting to rise because of the increase in the number of trees and forests. So now plant evolution has reached a uh, more, much more com complex state. And here you notice that in the Carboniferous period, uh, just at the time of the Permian period, you have oxygen levels that are 30 percent uh, of the atmospheric level, 30 percent of the air in the atmosphere at that time was oxygen. That's a lot of oxygen. In fact, it's the maximum amount of oxygen because at 30 percent or 35 percent oxygen in the air, when lightning would hit a tree, it would burn. It would burst into flames because there was so much oxygen. So that would kill the trees. That would stop making the oxygen. So the oxygen would fall. And then you'd grow more trees. You have more oxygen. They would burn. So it comes to a steady state over a long period of time of very high oxygen levels. And these are the, these are the trees that we uh, are using in our cars today as the oil. This is the Carboniferous age. The initial evolution of the trees, they had, didn't have a good root system, so they fell over easy, and bacteria and microorganisms hadn't figured out how to eat lignin yet. Lignin was a new invention. Uh, so the trees would uh, be submerged in the swamps before they could be 
uh, decayed out, and that carbon taken out of the atmosphere, taken out of the environment, meant oxygen, uh, the carbon taken away means oxygen would rise even more. Until, oh, okay, and what does that mean? Well, two things, bigger body size. More oxygen, the bigger the body. Um, so um, here you have a scorpion that's almost nine feet long. And the other part of it is it's easier flight. You have more oxygen for the energy. And also since the nitrogen stayed the same, the extra oxygen added to it. So the barometric pressure was 20% greater and the extra density uh, made it easier to fly. So you had these giant insects. This, probably the largest uh, uh, oxygen consuming animal ever to exist, flying at a two feet long dragonfly. This really refers to the first section. Uh, we, we hear a lot about uh, origins of life and underwater sea vents basically operating in an oxygen free environment, uh, but chemically very similar, processing things like iron and sulfur. Uh, how do these affect the um, how do these affect the oxygen situation? I mean, you had to have something before the oxygen could do it. But those particular organisms that live at the sea vent, for example, uh, those are called extremophiles, and they are very similar to the archaea that were the ancestor organism for our mitochondria. So they were able to use not energy from oxygen so much, but they were able to use the energy in sulfur and iron and things like that uh, for their, uh, but they did oxidative energy metabolism uh, in those environments. Um, and as I said, so uh, it was one of those types of organisms that got engulfed um, um, to, to be uh, our progenitor of our mitochondria. Yeah, Joe, I was just wondering, considering the amount of oxygen could be as high as 30%. Uh, so with change in climate, we're seeing a lot of carbon dioxide that is resulting from burning fossil fuels winding up in the oceans. So at some point, the oceans become saturated. Are we going to see a spike in, is it likely we'll see a spike in the atmospheric oxygen? Well, uh, it's uh, obviously it's there's, there's a lot of factors. There's a lot of factors, but uh, as we add carbon to the environment, if it's in the biosphere, then we adding the carbon, it's going to use oxygen and take oxygen out of the environment. Um, so um, you have that, but you also have all the effects that will occur with changes in uh, temperature. I didn't point out that the, uh, during this period of uh, 500 million years, you went through a number of. Uh, uh, warm periods and cold periods, uh, remembering that uh, cold air and cold water ca have much more oxygen uh, that they can carry but require more energy to stay warm in. So uh, they're complex. Uh, they're, I don't know how a little bit of increased CO2 will affect oxygen over the short term, let alone the long term. Yeah, I don't think we know. You showed a picture of a horseshoe crab and I was just wondering, I know they have blue blood. Um, are they using oxygen the same way we do or uh, as other arthropods do? Yeah, so, so same, if you allow similar rather than same, then I'll say yes. It, the blue is a, a hemocyanin, so it's an it's a, uh, oxygen carrier similar to our hemoglobin, but, uh, but it has, uh, has a blue color to it. Uh, and also, uh, in cold water, uh, those, uh, it carries much more oxygen uh, uh, for, for the crab. But the horseshoe crab, if you turn them over, at the bottom where the legs are, where the legs attach, there's little holes that go in, and the book lungs, the so-called book lungs, line those bottom segments. So they're, they're a big book lung uh, uh, organism. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Joe Lamana. Dr. Lamana is a past chair of Case Western Reserve University's Department of Anatomy. In the second part of our talk, we learned how animals developed the ability to use oxygen and were then able to come out of the seas and onto the land about 500 million years ago. In our final segment, Dr. Lamana will discuss how different classes of land animals have evolved in response to the need to absorb and use oxygen.
Now, back to our talk. And now we're in a period of time where uh, there's a, from high oxygen, there's a crash to low oxygen in a geologically relatively short period of time. And the reasons, there are many reasons proposed for this that we won't go into, but the effect of this drop from hyperoxia to hypoxia is um, a uh, evolutionary uh, kick in the butt because the organisms that had inefficient oxygen transporting systems are falling out and are uh, dying away. Those that are most efficient can take an advantage and, and, uh, and, and grab a uh, niche. So, and it's, if you look at the period of time here at the Permian-Triassic boundary, this is 250 million years ago, and this is just at the time when the uh, dinosaur uh, reptiles are beginning their domination of land. So let's take a little bit of look at this situation. And what we know first is about this time, uh, just preceding it a little bit, are the amphibians. And the amphibians really were the inventors of the uh, lung, the air sac lung, like the frog I showed you earlier. And there's a question of where that and when this occurred a little bit, but here are two of the uh, favorite candidates, Venta stega, 360 million years ago, and Tiktaalik, and that's 330 million years ago. And these were, if you look at them, these uh, are kind of fish with flat heads, and they got feet like fins. Now, it's not clear whether they were able to uh, hold themselves on land by these feet, so we don't know how strong they were. Uh, the other advantage that something like Tiktaalik um, had was uh, the beginning of an uh, independent neck movement and a shoulder uh, girdle that could allow them to uh, walk on the land. But the land organisms, animals that really started to take off were in reptiles. Now, there's an interesting uh, phenomenon that we find in reptiles, and you may not have thought about it, because I, I admit I hadn't thought about it before this type of an analysis, but when you see reptiles walking, their feet are splayed out, their arms and legs are splayed out more, and it turns out that they can't run and breathe at the same time um, because there's no support for the, for the lung when they're running. So if you notice them, they kind of scamper and then stop and then they breathe a little bit, and then they scamper and stop and breathe a little bit. Uh, the, the, the lizard that does the best uh, the, uh, at this is the Komodo dragon that can go 30 feet before it has to stop and breathe. So the, the reptiles, uh, because of their uh, shoulder structure and the way that their rib cage is set, uh, can't, don't do well breathing and running, and that gives a, uh, that's a pretty negative uh, uh, characteristic if you're going to try to be a predator. So most reptiles sit and wait and then spring on prey rather than try to chase them down. Now, um, the first dinosaur uh, species, phyla, turned out that they, uh, their adaptation was uh, bipedalism so maybe the first dinosaurs were thought to actually be bipedal. Uh, in any case, even the, the four-legged uh, type, most of which were thought to have evolved from two-legged dinosaurs, bipedal dinosaurs, meaning that they are up on two legs moving and they're free to breathe while they're running. Now that's a tremendous advantage to be able to get energy supplied by breathing uh, at the same time as you're moving rapidly. Um, and if you take a look at uh, these kind of two-legged dinosaurs, these rib cages are very large. You, you see uh, what an advantage that might be. They also have an avian-style lung, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this later. And the avian lung uh, 
combined with the fact that they could breathe while they were running, means that the dinosaur was probably the most efficient land animal uh, invented uh, for being able to get oxygen in and, and turning it into energy. And they were likely homeotherms. That is, uh, they likely kept and moderated their body temperature to a constant temperature. First of all, they're large, and when they're large, it takes a long time for uh, an animal to cool off. If it's a three feet diameter uh, uh, dinosaur, you can calculate that heat loss from that large an animal would uh, take uh, 48 hours to cool to environmental temperature. So cooling off was not a problem for large dinosaurs. They didn't have to go dormant at night and wait a while to warm up to get prey. They were already pretty warm. In fact, probably their major problem was getting rid of heat. And on the line heading towards uh, the, the, the mammals, you have the uh, Dimetrodon. Now, Dimetrodon died out years, uh, millions of years, decades, uh, or tens of millions of years uh, before the rise of the dinosaurs. Uh, they, this, this is the sail, uh, sail uh, reptile that you, you see uh, uh, portrayed fairly often. This was probably a heat uh, exchanger to get rid of heat. And then you also had later the therapsids that were kind of simultaneous with the rise of the dinosaurs. Uh, Lystrosaurus is the most uh, uh, common and successful uh, species uh, and was said to have, uh, as you see, it's more upright with a barrel chest. These were uh, uh, kind of characteristics that allowed better survival, better competition uh, by, these, um, b by these particular um, um, ancestors, in a sense, ancestor species to the ma mammalian line. Now, what I want to do uh, is, uh, so the successful lungs, the alveolar lung that the uh, Lystrosaurus uh, line eventually developed, and the avian-type lung that were, that were in dinosaurs were the two successful uh, responses to the period of time of low oxygen uh, from 250 million years uh, to present, uh, towards present. And I wanted to spend a little bit, a few minutes with the bird lung so you understand the advantage of the bird lung. Uh, so this may be complicated structures here, but the concept is, uh, is fairly straightforward. The bird lung has essentially two sets of air sacs, one for air coming in and one for air going out. Now, when we breathe with our lungs, we breathe in and breathe out. And there's what is called dead space. That is, the last air we breathe in, we never sees our lung. It's in our air system. And the air that we breathe out, as it comes out of the lungs, it's already been disoxygenated. So that's not that efficient. What a bird does, it only sends the air through in one direction. So breathes in, air goes in a sac, and then the air comes out of the sac and goes through the, the lung in one direction and is collected into another sac. And when the bird breathes out, the air comes from that sac. So the air only goes one way through the uh, bird lung, and it is uh, very effective and efficient, it's calculated even at uh, sea level, that it's 33% more efficient. Well, 33% efficiency increase is a big advantage. And in fact, if you go at 15,000 feet, which is getting to the point where you're almost half an atmosphere, uh, half the level of oxygen, not quite, it's even more efficient. So the, the less oxygen there is, the more, uh, the more efficient that avian lung uh, has. Now, where this might have a big advantage for organisms that have this system, when the uh, Earth's atmosphere was in a hypoxic state, oxygen levels down around 12% rather than 20%, which is somewhere around 15,000 feet altitude, then 
organisms that had this lung didn't have barriers when they were crossing hills and mountains. Whereas for mammals, if, uh, when the atmosphere is at 12%, uh, you have a barrier to movement because you cannot go up the mountain and down the next valley because you will be um, uh, in a hypoxic state. Now, I just wanted to show a couple of more. Oh, good. Okay. Good. Time is good. So a couple of more slides. Uh, this, is the, this is a cast. This is from a recent paper in Nature. Uh, this is the cast in a uh, bird, and the blue here are the air sacs. So you can see the hollow bones, all the spaces between the bones act as an air space for the bird. It breathes into these spaces and then breathes out through the, uh, uh, the uh, expiratory sac. I think of this a lot like a uh, bagpipe in a way. The bagpipe gives you a continuous song and you pump it, the air goes in, goes out only one way. Um, so he's got this bagpipe system. Uh, and if you, uh, so this is the uh, an anatomical uh, cast and this would be a more functional diagram showing which the air goes in one and out the other. And now this paper uh, was an, also an analysis of a dinosaur, um, this uh, Allosaurus type raptor um, skeleton, uh, fairly well preserved, where they were able to show corresponding spaces in the dinosaur uh, to an avian bird. And by this they are suggesting strongly that this style of dinosaur had the bird lung. Um, and the evidence is uh, increasing that the dinosaur had the bird lung and would give them the advantage as the predator. Um, and here we're just going to summarize a little bit the types we talked about. The pure diffusion that we saw in sponges, well, that's still around uh, in uh, uh, amphibians. Uh, they, they exchange a lot of uh, oxygen across their skin. Um, and uh, many species can uh, do, uh, can provide a lot, uh, most of their uh, uh, oxygen through uh, absorption through the skin, called an open system. And the capillaries fill the skin close to the, where the oxygen is. And then you have the fish gills as the uh, w fluid passes through. And I didn't mention the countercurrent, but the, uh, the more oxygenated fluid meets the more uh, the least oxygen containing blood in a countercurrent. The bird lung actually acts as a cross current. It's a continuous oxygenation. And the mammalian lung. Those are the four uh, primary types of uh, respiratory organs. And now, in the last section, I just want to spend two seconds, well, three, on the future. And uh, the future of lung and lung science and adaptation for humans uh, are going to be in. Uh, extreme environments, how we deal with altitude, how we deal with ocean depths, and how we deal with space. And this, a lot of this future, we're talking about the virtual lung that we had the lecture on last week, um, about understanding how the lung works so that in these altered environments, each presenting uh, a, a different challenge, uh, how uh, the uh, human lung can adapt to these circumstances not as a biological adapter, but as a technical adapter. So our, uh, our lung evolution is turning into a technical uh, uh, challenge. And then, uh, so this is current in, and very close future. This, by the way, is a picture of Christopher Pizzo, who was a member, a uh, physician member of the climbing team of the American uh, Medical Research Expedition to Everest in uh, 1978, I think it was, led by John West. 81 it was? Yeah. Uh, 81. And here he is uh, taking his test of his respiratory gases at the top of the world in, uh, in Everest. This is sampling his end expired uh, breath, which is showing a uh, carbon dioxide level equivalent of uh, 7 millimeters of mercury in the blood instead of 40. The, the lowest uh, value ever uh, recorded in a, in a living, walking person uh, on the top of Mount Everest. Uh, OK, so earth and air, near term, 
Well, it's affected this, uh, Peter, you brought up this uh, issue. It's affected by uh, temperature. We're, in, we're coming out of an ice age, we know from long term, so it's going to get warmer. How is that going to affect levels of oxygen? What do we do with the carbon? Uh, uh, those, those probably are two major issues as to what's going to happen with the oxygen. Uh, for the midterm, well, you know, the continents are still moving and crashing into one another, and there's going to be another pen geotype uh, uh, continent, and that's going to change volcanoes, and that's going to affect the atmosphere. And the end game, if you were, anyone was afraid that we were going to get burned up by the sun expanding, uh, you don't have to worry about it because way before that, it's going to blow the atmosphere off the earth, and we won't have to, uh, we won't have to worry about that. I leave with one final thought, <laughs> but not for another four billion years, I hope. I got to ask Glenn about that. Uh, uh, one last point, to show the mammalian lung does have some uh, uh, strength to it in, uh, in its design. Uh, if, uh, elephants can walk across the bottom of a river, or they can swim, and they're able to breathe. And you say, well, sure, they put their trunk up, and they act as a siphon, and they can breathe. But their lungs are two feet below the surface of the water, and there is no way they can, uh, a normal lung can, can fill with the diaphragm action. So how do they do it? Well, there's a little adaptation they have whereby there's no intrapleural space, there's fibrous connection. It doesn't work by having a diaphragm pull open passively, but works by muscular expansion of the lungs themselves. And so uh, there's more than one way to get a breath of air. <laughs> and uh, with that, I'll say thank you and I'll ask for uh, questions. This lecture is part of the Origins Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. It has been brought to you with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, and MediaVision. For more information on the Origins Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.